Okay, um, am I loud enough? My, I'm a bit hoarse, so. Uh, we go to a different set of dikes. What we understand as dikes in uh, Flanders, these are embankment dikes in the coastal plain, so they're not that impressive, they're not that high, they don't have um, clear identities like the ones we've just seen all. Um, but they're there and they have maybe some similar aspects in them. It's not the Dutch, but the Flemish who were known for building dikes in the medieval time. I always like to say this. <laughs> <laughs> this is no, no one has the Dante. Dante don't, won't treat Italian, but uh, Dante knows the Flemish as the people who are who are the ones who fear the floods that rushes towards them and who build them sea walls, uh, causing the sea to flee. So this is a the common narrative as the well the sea dikes are there in order to uh, keep the sea away to 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 protect the land uh, against the water. This is of course valuable, but I'd like to tell another story that the dikes was not. Uh, did not start as protective earthworks against the sea, but started in another way. In order to do so, I will look to two aspects, the functional aspect and the ideological aspect. For the ideological aspect, I will uh, try to relate dikes to elements of power, uh, and that is especially the successful establishment of a new governance structure by a warlord, the Count of Flanders, between the end of the 9th and the early 12th century. For the environmental, <coughs> functional aspects, um, we look towards the maritime attitude, or not, that is there in coastal Flanders. Maritime for me means the liminal aspect, the maritime zone, the coastal region is where you enter the world or you leave the world and uh, where things get exchanged. Liminal is central for a maritime environment. I will look to um, the social reproduction strategies in the landscape using so sources that I will show you later and I will try to study these uh, social reproduction uh, through yeah. social property relations, envi environmental transformations, monumentality and so on. But so far for the approach. Let's go to Flanders. This is Flanders in the late Roman and early medieval time. You will not recognize it from uh, when you compare it today because that in that time it was uh, most of all a very wet uh, area with a lot of salt marshes <coughs> and also inland marshes and um, there was no coastal erosion yet. Coastal erosion that mainly happened in the late medieval period. For instance the actual estuary of the Schelde was only created around 1400 which you see here which means that for instance also Domburg you might know the Emporium of Domburg was actually in the same geomorphological zone as Flanders we start the story <coughs> with the Turp society like I showed late Roman early medieval uh, we have a um, very large salt marsh area and these salt marshes were inhabited just like they were in Friesland, in Frisia. Um, people in the salt marshes herded sheep, a lot of sheep, huge flocks of sheep, and they produced textiles, uh, produced fleeces, produced wool that was brought into the uh, trade network. And we know that uh, the people uh, who lived on the dwelling mounds, just like in Friesland, had access to luxuries, uh, luxuries from the Rhineland, luxuries from Scandinavia even, luxuries from overseas, from England. Uh, we can describe this world, this world of the Turf Society, <coughs> as a, well, yeah, a very open society, uh, where people lived in a kind of equilibrium with the tides and the salt marshes. They did not use dikes that's important to stress their main product was the palia frisonica the frisian mantle uh, and indeed when you excavate the sites of the the turps um, in flanders you will see a bone assemblage of 75 percent of sheep bone which is of course to be expected and it 
goes on from the se early 7th century up to the 11th century. We know, by the way, where they were buried. They were buried in the dune belt. Uh, these are very recent excavations. This is one of the cemeteries of the, this population. They were not buried in the salt marsh of the clay, but in the sand of the dunes. And so that's a very peaceful society in equilibrium. But then things change. And it changes at the end of the 9th century with the arrival of the warlord. And the warlord is the Count of Flanders. Count of Flanders, Baldwin II especially, um, who is a remarkable figure. He's connected to both the Carolingian dynasty as the Anglo as the Wessex dynasty. Um, he is the brother-in-law to Ethelflaed and Edward the Elder. Um, and he is the son uh, of, of the grandson of Charles the Bald uh, of West Francia. Now, he starts in a very small parhus or county uh, <coughs> as a, just a local count by 880 and five years later he appears to be one of the largest or the, the most uh, powerful and richest lords in the west. No one knows how he did it but he did succeed in this remarkable uh, building up of power and the dynasty that comes from Baldwin and his White after it. Um, well, that is even more successful until more or less 1200. What do we know about their race to power, about their state formation, and how they uh, created this powerful county? Well, they we know that they are responsible for the construction of a set of fortresses. They were not built all in the same time. First of them were built late 9th century, second half of the 9th century. But they continue building out these, these set of fortresses until the middle of the 10th century, even late 10th century. Amongst them are, um, uh, for instance, Bruges, which starts from a very small peat uh, fortification into a, and that develops into a large uh, Ottonian like falls with a, a copy of the Collegiate Church of Aachen, of the, the Dom of Aachen. Uh, but also Verne, Verne, which is here, which comes from a ring fortress that you still see on this map, and which has also an important uh, church. The recipe for these uh, fortresses is always the same. You have a garrison, very clearly, you have a garrison together with the fortification for around 150 to 200 members of a certain warband. You have an aula of the count, uh, so it, uh, there is governance. You have the collegiate churches and relics, and you have uh, early markets which connect to storage houses. Storage houses where the produce of the estates of the Count of Flanders is brought to. Important to know is that most of these fortresses, except for Kent, Ypres, and but the other ones, like you see, they're concentrated in the coastal plain. That has, of course, to do with the connection, the liminal aspect of the coastal plain. But it also means that the Turk society, these Frisian-like coastal dwellers, have new neighbors. Well, you know that the Turk dwelling mounds could be communal, but mm, but for no, not more than, let's say, 30, 40, 50 people. Well, all of a sudden they get a very interesting new neighbor, a very powerful <coughs> new neighbor. And this new neighbor will be for them in the coastal plain a, cha a game changer. Um, during my PhD, I never did it again afterwards, uh, I was able to reconstruct the property structure of the coastal plain going up to the 10th century. The white fields, this is the region between the present time of Ostend and the present time of Newport. The white fields are allodial fields. These are free lands. And this is exactly the area where we find the dwelling mounds and the early, early medieval material. The color bits are the comital estates. We do very know, we know, we know very well where the comital estates are to be found. So they're, they're found next to the tidal channels and next to the uh, places where the tidal channels go into the open sea. Here is one tidal channel. Here is another, yeah, 
to live at Hazard, you have to know actually. So it means that in a very small region, both um, reproduction strategies, being an allodio sheep farmer that lives from trade, that they co na live next to a very powerful war warlord which is with its own uh, purposes, with his manners, comital manners. In their landscape, we have things like common pool resources. They use the salt marshes together for their own purposes. We have no rents, no, service, no services. Uh, we have smaller land holdings later on. And we have a large communal church in this region. We have rents and services. We have knights. We have private churches. And in this region, we have the start of the embankment, the start of dike building. Indeed, we see that, we notice that next to uh, comital manners in these US states, we find that um, in the field structure, excuse me from English once in a while, uh, we notice nuclear embankments. <coughs> Nuclear embankments in a place named uh, evidence they are known as Kromadiken, curved dikes. That's exactly what it means. They're named like this in the late medieval <coughs> land books. Um, but it's a um, it's a common feature. You find them everywhere in the coast in the communal estates. Once in a while, the earthworks are still preserved, but that's rather rare. More uh, of the time, you will find them just in the field structure. Why are these produced here, these uh, nuclear embankments? Probably to create haylands and to create a yeah, kind of protected area close to the comital manor. It also means that there is a shift in mentality. The mentality goes from living in a salt marsh towards a controlled environmental uh, or a controlled environment. The next step they take is going from the nuclear embankments to systematic embankments uh, to longitudinal dikes next to the tidal channels and for instance on this map you see very clear how it works. You have two embankments next to the tidal channel and the salt, mar salt marshes are reduced to small strips next to the channels. Um, also here, oh you, see, you see the dike also here. Um, and that happens in the uh, entire coastal plain. This is an island. This is the island of Katsant, present name. And uh, Katsant <coughs> means actually uh, the case at the beach. K, Kade, uh, so, so we have a lot of prograding embankments coming from these nuclear embankments, prograding ever, ever more until they reach the, yeah, until the whole coastal plain is actually uh, embanked. It means that there is, dr there is a dramatic change of the coastal environment. It means that the environmental di dynamics won't be the same. You get a, s uh, a freshwater environment, of course, but also there is Thank you. Um, there is an element of power there because it's the count who builds the dikes. It's also the count who controls the dikes. This is more or less an image to show how it shifts from salt marsh area to an embanked area with sluices, dikes, uh, also uh, houses for uh, people to wash the sea because the sea is now dangerous where it was not dangerous before. And this is especially the thing I wanted to show you. This are, these are the overdrachten. Overdragen, I can't uh, really translate it. These are kind of ship lifts. Because what you had was an open area and now the area is closed. So the farmers who want to trade goods and they traded a lot of uh, goods uh, now have to cross these dikes where they did not have to cross them before, of course. And there was a kind of technology invented, kind of lift technology, control. I don't know how you say this in English. You either by horses or by manpower, you pull the ship 
over <laughs> the uh, dikes uh, and you don't do it for free uh, or um, the count collects tolls every time a ship has to cross a dike every time someone uses this system they have to pay tolls the tolls are controlled by knights comital knights the vinites uh, who form a kind of new elite in the coastal region which means that um, the maritime environment is reduced and access is uh, actually access to the world access to the economy is kind of feudalized and also means that he invented queuing <laughs> for sure <laughs> Um, I will skip this one. This is, these are the sites of the knights, but I don't have the time. We have yeah. Okay. Well, just like I said, these are the sites of the knights. This is part of the redesign of the landscape behind the dikes. You get a kind of feudal landscape with these new elites that control the environmental infrastructure. And they have a kind of, yeah, these... Uh, these tasks, they are, call, they are called the fortiores et meliores, they have riding duties, they are the scabini, so they, they, uh, they rule. They have moated sites, which are kind of imitation motten and bailey sites. Once in a while, these uh, motten and bailey sites come on top of early medieval sites even, so it's not only the comital area, but also in the freeland area that their uh, landscape language is introduced. Um, and we find archaeologically a lot of horse gear on these sites. So it goes along with the riding duties they have as knights. It's part of the new elite that controls the embanked land. Now, part of the theme of Tag is time. What happens to these dikes afterwards? I mean, they had an important impact. They changed the landscape. They changed perception of environment and so on um, and after they were created <coughs> what happened to them well what happened was that they had they were shifted uh, place many times especially during the 14th and 15th centuries because what happens when you embank an entire landscape an entire salt marsh is that coastal erosion starts high energy conditions of the tides will now no longer be able to spread freely over the salt marsh but will now start to eat your coast. So what happens is that the dikes have to be brought backward like you see over here. The orange strip is entirely lost land. It's part of land that was entirely lost to the sea in especially the 15th century including an entire town the first version of ostend was drowned entirely by the sea so these are kind of yeah unforeseen consequences of the building of the dikes you had heavy costs you had to maintain and change again these dikes you had uh, these heavy costs to repair the dikes to build the dikes again went along with Surplus, ex surplus extraction, which caused a social and economic car a crisis, especially in the Lodio <coughs> uh, area where the old Turk society lived, which led to abandonment. I'm going to the conclusions. <laughs> <laughs> so, in general, the dikes I studied related to a strategy of investing in new landscapes of, uh, landscapes of environmental and social control. They're clearly embodiments of feudal governance for me. They're not so much at their start necessary uh, items in the salt marshes. You could live in the salt marshes without dikes. So dikes do not to be associated necessarily with progression, with linear progression. On the contrary, they mark a shift in the attitude which was not necessary as <coughs> I said as such. And by reducing the maritime perspective, the maritime, um, how do you say this, uh, perception, the liminal character, the open access, was pushed back to isolated <coughs> ports of trade uh, to linear landscape, coastal landscape. Although the shifting 
of the temporality from social control to environment struggle in the long run means that today we have to face the return of the maritime. Thank you.